Have you started investing yet? Are you interested but not sure where to start? This is the episode for you. Today, our guest is Eric Cooper, a financial planner with Triangle Financial Group. Eric is specialized in investment strategies, business strategies, retirement income planning, college funding, estate planning, and so much more. So if you need guidance or you're a seasoned vet who is looking to learn more, then stick around for today's episode. You're listening to Triangle's Making Money Personal Podcast, where we engage in real talk about financial matters that affect our community. Today's episode is sponsored by Triangle Credit Union, recently voted Best Credit Union in New Hampshire. Boom, we're live. Eric, what's going on? It's going great. How are you, Wilmer? I'm doing well. Loving it and living it, as my dad used to say. Yeah. So how's the, uh, the financial world? Tell me about it. How'd you get into this? Oh, how did I get into this? So it's actually an interesting story. I got into it out of necessity, really. Um, so a lot of people kind of choose what they want to do. They go to school for it and they kind of follow that predetermined track into their chosen industry. And, um, and for me, um, I needed a higher income. I was working at a local credit unit at the time and Fidelity across the street was hiring. And one of the tellers went and got a job over there and I was like, man, I can't pay the bills on the job that I have. So she got hired across the street. I'm going to go check out what they got across the street. So I ended up getting on with Fidelity Investments um, way back in the day. And that is what started my path um, down this journey. So I spent about 40 years there, ended up getting investment license and working with people in retirement planning and a couple stops along the way. And now I own a financial planning practice, uh, working with Triangle Financial Group doing uh, financial planning for businesses and individuals all across the country. So it's a good life. That's awesome. That is awesome. That's awesome. So this is Terry here, Eric. It's good to see you. We're so glad to have you on. You too, Terry. Um, so Eric, just to, uh, tell me like why, why are people um, so ready to hop in the market right now? What's, what's the reason why people are ready to start investing? Well, I think the, the answer to that is pretty simple. The market is really hot right now and everybody's been making money for, for, a, a little bit at this point. Um, so I think that there's a couple things converging here. Number one is that a lot of people have experienced a reduction in income, at least temporarily with COVID. So people are paying attention a lot more to alternative ways to increase their assets, their net worth, or have somewhere to draw cash flow from. So that's number one. Number two is that the equity markets in America have been doing very well for the last few years. And people are seeing those results in their 401ks in their investment accounts and other areas that they have money. So they're looking at that and saying, okay, this has done really well. I'd like to experience more of this. How do I learn a little bit more? How do I, how do I become even better, more efficient, a little bit smarter? How can I add more to this pool of money that's doing so well? And so it's just, it's, it's got a real high, um, it's got real high visibility right now. Investing when it's going really well, it's got a lot of visibility with the general populace. Um, when it's not going well, it has a lot of visibility with the general populace. Anywhere in the middle <laughs> is kind of off the radar. So we've we've experienced both extremes over the last decade here, but that's where we that's where we sit today. So I actually have a follow-up question for you. So you had mentioned like 401ks, right? And um, I get the 401k. I've been long enough, I've been around long enough to actually have administered a 401k in my well, previous employer and um, and have I was actually participating and administering at one point. So anyway, but my question is what happens if you're, you know, if either you're self-employed or your uh, employer doesn't have a 401k and you want to, you know, you'd still want to do some investing. You want to get in the market. Sure. No, that's a great question. So a couple pieces of context um, to share with you uh, before I provide the answer to that question. The first is in investments are investments. Um, retirement investing is different than non-retirement investing. Um, the difference is primarily how that money is taxed. The stuff that you can own in each of these accounts is the same stuff, but the wrapper around the money determines how it's taxed. So when we think about getting into investing in general, whether you have a 401k or an IRA or not, you can invest in the markets just through an individual investment account. It just might not be treated the same tax wise. So anybody can get into 
investing. Um, if you don't have the benefits of a 401k or retirement plan through work, um, or if you're self-employed, there are some ways you can do it on your own. An individual retirement account is a retirement account with, with tax, favorable tax treatment, uh, typically, that you can do independent of any employer. Um, if you're self-employed, there are options um, like simple IRAs and some other things, depending on how large you are and the situation and, and consulting with a financial advisor um, that you can do within your firm, within your company that are not a traditional 401k. So 401ks, 403bs, you need to be a certain company size. There's a lot of restrictions around it, um, but there's a lot of options outside of that. But yeah, really all that just has to do with how the money's treated for taxes, not whether or not you can invest, if that makes sense. Okay. All right. So um, again, another follow-up question. I'm sorry, Will. I'm just like, I'm, I guess I must be full of no, questions today. So um, if we were in that situation and as a member of Triangle Credit Union, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this shameless plug right now, but as a member of Triangle Credit Union and I'm not in the market, I want to be in the market. This is when I actually call you, right? I call up Triangle Financial Group and I say, you know, I'd like to talk to you about, you know, having some investments. And then you get through this role or through our membership at Triangle, they have access to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. The okay. first stop um, on our side really should be a conversation with myself or another member of our team, because there are a lot of ways that somebody can get into investing. And what is the right way for them is going to depend on their individual situation. And really what my main role is as a member of Triangle Financial Group is to be an educator, is to be a filter, is to take all of this general information about investing and the markets and everything and translate it into something meaningful and actionable to that particular member. Without that context, I, I say all the time, it's like, I can go on WebMD and read every single piece of information on there and have access to a lot of information that people otherwise wouldn't have access to unless they had some sort of medical degree, right? But it doesn't make me a doctor. I don't necessarily how to know how to take that information, sew it together and translate it into something that's meaningful and actionable to me. That's the role that we play as financial planners within Triangle Financial Group. So if you're interested in getting involved with investing, we can certainly help you. Um, but primarily how we're gonna help you is providing context and framework, and then you'll know the key players and you'll be able to make a choice that you're confident about. That's awesome. Excellent. That is great. Great information there. Um, so Eric, what in your opinion is the, what, what is the reason people should be investing? Uh, whether the market's good, whether it's bad, why should people just get started? I, I love this question because nobody asks this question. Everybody, it's, so, it's such a simple question. We all assume that we understand the answer to the question. But let me really boil this down to, to the, the, the foundation of it because I think this is going to help build a lot of the, or provide context to a lot of the conversation that we'll have in the rest of today's uh, podcast. The simple answer is people invest money over time to create financial resources that afford them the most flexibility and quality of choices in life. Money is just a tool, it's a medium of exchange. So there are many things in life that we value that we exchange money for, right? Whether that's a certain lifestyle or investing in the well being of others or relationships that are important to you or whatever the case is in your, in your personal life, right? Or simply buying back time that we would otherwise be spending trying to create an income or try to earn an income later. Money is a medium of exchange. So to the extent that it supports your personal efficacy, to the extent that it supports your purpose, to the extent that it represents additional or quality of choices in your life, we invest to create more of the tradable resources so that we have more options. That's the basic idea of all this stuff, right? Whether you're investing in the markets, whether you're right. buying investment properties, whether you run a business, it's what we're all trying to do. Quality of life, options. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't know what I'm going to be doing when I'm 55 years old. Do you know what you're going to be doing when you're 55 years old? Hey, I am 55. I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you, did you just set me up, Eric? Like, someone tell you. Like, Carrie, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> uh, younger. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, no, no prior intel there. For <laughs> no. But you know, it's, we, we don't, we don't even know what our life is going to be like in five years. So what having more of the exchangeable resource allows us to have is control. 
Mm. It takes a lot of the variables right. that could make decisions for us and it gives us more control or if not total control, at least influence over those variables to allow us to steer our ship in the direction that we want it to go. That's the whole idea behind investing. It, unless the number on the balance sheet has some sort of connective tissue to something you value, it's just stuff. It's just a number mm. and it's not very useful. Right. So right. Eric, you know, you're talking about options and things like that. And I don't know if this is actually uh, relative to to what you were saying when you were talking about options. When a lot of people talk about investing, they mention diversification. So can you explain what a diversified portfolio is and why it's so important? Sure. Yeah, we can take diversified in portfolio, very abstract academic sounding words, and we'll put them on an island and blow them up. <laughs> we'll get right down to <laughs> right down to what it actually means. So investing either takes a form of being an owner right such as owning a piece of a company by purchasing their stock right we're all familiar with that concept it can also take the form of being a lender um for example a bond the way a bond works you might buy a 20-year bond from a municipality for a thousand dollars you're lending that municipality a thousand dollars to fix their roads build a stadium whatever they're trying to do with it right the agreement is they'll pay you the coupon rate every year let's say it's three percent so on $1,000, that'd be $30 a year for 20 years. And at the end of the 20 years, you get your $1,000 back. So you're basically giving them a $1,000 loan for 20 years. They pay you 30 bucks a year. At the end of the 20 years, you get your money back. It's another form of investing, but it's investing by being a lender instead of by being an owner. So those are the two main ways that you can, you know, the actual nuts and bolts of it work when you're in the investment markets. So our economy is so large and so complex that at any different given time, there are segments of our economy where being an owner or a lender is favorable and segments where being an owner or a lender is unfavorable it's almost impossible to guess ahead of time what areas of the market will be doing what and when so trying to guess and make moves on hunches is what we call market timing and it's a losing proposition for long-term investors so a more measured approach is is simply owning the right stuff in the right proportions so that when one piece of of your investments or what we call your portfolio and by portfolio, we just mean all the investments that you have. Uh, when one piece of your portfolio is suffering, you've got enough in other areas that are that are holding it up, holding up its value and doing well to compensate for the loss that you're experiencing over here to counter that effect. So to achieve the best chance at success over a long time with a, over a longer period of time with investing, you need to be invested in a wide variety of areas that react differently in different market conditions. This is what we mean when we say diversification. Now, determining the proportions of how much stuff goes where is called asset allocation. That is related, but a different concept than diversification. Diversification is how spread out your risk is. Asset allocation is the proportions where you choose to concentrate your, you know, what areas of the economy you put your, and the, the proportion at which you concentrate it. Okay. Thank you so much for that explanation. Right. I had never heard, I, you know, honestly, I think I always thought that asset allocation and diversification were interchangeable. So thank you for, for clearing that up. That was excellent. You're welcome. Yeah, that was a very detailed way to explain that. And I think we all, like, you know, we work in this industry, so we have an idea of what you're talking about. But when you put it, when you lay it out the way that you did, it makes more sense completely. So uh, definitely. Thank you. For oh, that, you're Eric. Welcome. Um, Eric, let's talk about and honestly, not to, inter I, I have to interrupt one thing. I, I want to just say this. I really hope that this podcast does get a visual only because Eric is so flamboyant with his arm gestures about when he talks about portfolio. <laughs> as an allocation. Yeah. <laughs> It's really charged he, up. He does a great job at illustrating. And, and my pink golf sweater. Yes, it looks my lucky good. pink golf sweater. Good. <laughs> okay. Yesterday, I went 210 yards with a five iron, which is which is long for me in the, in this golf sweater. So that I think, is you know, impressive. I had to wear it to the podcast. Today. Anyway, okay, wow. and we just found out that the financial planner is a golfer. Who would have thunk that, right? Ah, uh, you know. <laughs> I got into right. it. Well, I wasn't for the first four years in the business. I rejected it. I was like, I'm not going to be one of those guys. <laughs> and then one advisor convinced me to go out and then I got hooked. Oh yeah. And, uh, so between hunting and golfing and being a father and the financial planning business, 
my time is split up a lot of different ways, but I get out as often as I, I would can. say you're very diversified. I'm Ooh. very diversified, <laughs> oh. but I think my wife, I might, see what you uh, did there, my Terry. wife might have a bone to pick with the asset allocation <laughs> portfolio where my time is going. So uh. you too. <laughs> <laughs> me you too, too man. <laughs> me too. We're all in the same boat. We're all living the same life, right? <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Eric, um, I was going to ask a question about golf, uh, <laughs> not to get too much off topic. Um, <laughs> what's your handicap? Um, so I have a good friend and he says, all progress starts with the truth. I guess I don't want to get better because I don't want to know because I don't measure it <laughs> because I don't like, what I, would, I wouldn't like awesome. what I see. I went like I just started golfing a few years ago, so it's probably really, really bad. Talk to me when I'm like 38 years old, and it'll be like, you got it. Well, that should have been my answer right touché, there about touché. 55. A better golfer. That's really what my answer should have been. Like there you go. 55, right? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So back to the financial side of the podcast. As much as I <laughs> want to talk about golf all day, um, let's talk about compound interest. Eric, what is that? Um, we have some view, some listeners that often question about compound interest. So I'd love to know sure. more about that. So when we say compound interest, you get interest on the interest. Uh, so think of a snowball. So you start with a small portion of snow in your hand, and as you roll it, that ball gets bigger. But not only does the snowball get bigger, the bigger it gets, the more snow it picks up as you're continuing to roll it. And the, fat, and the bigger it gets, the faster it gets even bigger. So when, when you invest money, even a little bit, over time, that dollar will compound dozens and dozens and hundreds of times to create a much larger amount of wealth or assets than you could have achieved simply by saving it without investing it, or even saving it and investing it in a simple interest type of situation, right, where you're getting a stated interest rate on the initial deposit, but you're not necessarily getting growth on the growth. The key to compound interest, Will, is taking the time to bake the cake. You got to take yeah. the time to bake the cake long enough to reap the rewards. If you put it in the oven for five minutes and try to eat it, it's probably not going to be that great, right? So we like to say that time in the investment market is much more important than timing the investment market. It's not really about when you get yeah. in. It's about being properly diversified and allocated, but leaving it there long enough to let compounding take its course. Uh, if you look at the math of it, right or if you can just think about it in your mind if you invest a dollar and make 10 percent, you have a dollar 10 cents you gain 10 cents 10 percent is a decent rate of return by most standards but i mean it's 10 cents after that compounds for 15 right. to 20 years and that initial dollar that you started with is whatever throw a fake number the math probably won't work out but 30 dollars, right you make 10 percent. now you made three bucks and three dollars is what 300 times the size of 10 cents so it's taking the time to bake the cake is, is the key with compound interest and I'm, what i'm also hearing there is that the earlier you get started the better off you'll be is that absolutely the earlier you get started the better off you'll yeah. be so even when you look at the broader view of financial planning and how a lot of these strategies and products and and, and this framework fits together the younger you are the same dollar that you invest will have a lot more compounding power the closer you are to retirement, or a lot of people don't necessarily retire these days, but maybe they leave their nine to five and they go do passion work or work part time, take a few years off, whatever the case is, they eventually switch to some point where they're taking their assets and they're using their assets to either recreate or supplement their income. Once you make that switch or as you get closer to that switch, the money that you're putting into your investment accounts are a lot less powerful than the money that you put in 20, 30 years early. So a lot of times when we look at a curve over the course of time, where is most effective or the types of tools or the types of markets for people to put their money in is not the same when they're early in their career or the middle of their career versus the end of their career. Because really what we're trying to create is not necessarily the highest balance sheet. We're trying to create the most amount of harvestable wealth to provide some context to that or another way of saying it we want people to end up with the most amount of spendable and enjoyable money so they can actually experience the utility that they've earned from the wealth that they've saved as opposed to just the largest asset on the balance sheet sometimes those numbers are the same oftentimes they're not that's a, a different conversation but when it comes to compound interest yes 
the earlier on, the more powerful that dollar is. The later you get, the less effective it's going to be in terms of creating spendable and enjoyable wealth. Yeah, that makes total sense. Uh, um, the earlier you start, the better off. So if you're listening and you're, you know, 18 years old or 21 years old and you're just out of college and you're starting your career, definitely take advantage of your employer's 401k and especially if they're matching because they're literally giving you free money. So you not taking that money, you're leaving money on the table. So definitely get started as early as you can is what I'm hearing Absolutely. there. Thank you, Eric. Absolutely. Yep. Well, that's a good recap, Will. So Eric, how do you know when you have, uh, when an investment is good or not? How do you know? So the primary consideration with a long-term investment strategy, which is really what, what all this is, right? When we're talking about investing to build wealth for the future, we're not looking at one or two year increments. We're usually looking at 10, 15, 20, 30 year increments, whatever it is. So the primary consideration with whether a long-term investment is good or not is the asset allocation. So remember the asset allocation is the proportion of where the stuff is allocated, which is different than diversification, which is just making sure that you're spread out over enough things. So the first priority in long-term investing is to align the asset allocation to your goals. Generally speaking, the more stocks in your, that you have in your portfolio, the more aggressively that portfolio is positioned for long-term growth. But that also means it is most exposed to volatility in the meantime. So the right asset allocation differs depending on your goals and your time horizon, but the most important thing is to determine what asset allocation reflects your risk tolerance and your purpose for the investment. If you don't know how to do this, that's waving my hands here, <laughs> Triangle Financial Group. Um, if you don't know how to do that, reach out to a financial professional who can help you translate that. An investment that has good historical returns but doesn't align right with your with your goals is still not a good investment for you mm -hmm. so a stock that made your uncle a ton of money or a stock in your current employer whom you love also doesn't mean that they're good investments for you keep in mind when it comes to evaluating investments past performance of an investment does not foreshadow future results hmm. past performance of the investment does not foreshadow future results so a 1991 study called the Brinson study shows that 91.5% of your long-term returns are determined by having a proper asset allocation, not by the individual stocks and bond selections that are within the broader portfolio. So asset allocation alignment is where we start. That is the primary determinant of whether or not a long-term investment strategy is going to be right for a unique situation. Okay. Awesome. So I'm, I want to follow up on that. So what I'm hearing is that, you know, especially now today in 2021 a lot of people a lot of millennials let's call them are investing in in stocks individual stocks um with you know i, I don't want to name any apps but we all know the the ton of investment apps out there that allow you to invest in things like stocks bitcoin and yeah. other cryptos um how do you feel about that is that recommended i i feel like a lot of people again especially the younger demographic are doing that more for fun to play around to learn possibly uh maybe a little bit of clout there as well um how yeah, do you there's feel a about lot of that? clout chasing in the uh in the in the app trading game so how do i feel about it it's not necessarily it's not inherently good or bad if it's a way to play around have some fun and learn a thing or two there's nothing wrong with that it is not a replacement unless you're an experienced or a professional portfolio manager it's not a replacement for academic long-term investing not only because got it right so there's a couple variables that you're exposed to if you are doing the investment management you don't have the expertise number one is your own emotions when you touch a hot stove mm -hmm. you don't want to touch it again you get burned and you want to take your hand off yep. so generally speaking yep. Right, we all think that we're impervious and that we're robots and we're superhumans. But when you have a significant amount of money invested or a money that's amount of money that's significant to you, and you take a large loss on that, um, the other thing is life doesn't move in a straight line. Right, this might be long-term investments, but there might be things going on in your life where you might have an event where you need some liquidity, like maybe a down payment on a home or kids going off to college or something. We aren't expecting to have to dip into this money, but you kind of want to make sure that it's 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 on deck if you need it, right? A lot of things that people are yeah. going to need to consider in terms of the volatility of their portfolios. Anyway, 
all that to say our emotions and circumstances come into play and we make very different decisions emotionally from a place of abundance and a place of scarcity. So replacing long-term investing with individual trading is not a good idea on that alone. Uh, secondarily, you're looking at the issue of scale. If no matter, you might have $100,000, you might have a million dollars, you can only buy so many stocks or units of stock within that pool of money, especially if you're buying blue chip stocks that are high quality that have large share prices. If you're buying stocks that are $400 a share and you have $1,000, you can get what, two shares? Not many. When you're dealing with a mutual fund or a managed portfolio, where your money is pooled in a broader fund or portfolio with $10 billion with a bunch of other people's money, the amount of scale that that portfolio manager can use to diversify risk out is much, much, much more sophisticated than you or I can accomplish with our individual pool of money in an individual portfolio. So being able to get the returns but reduce the overall risk through diversification requires you to have enough money to spread it out in enough places and there's a limit in terms of our personal wealth. When we pull that with a bunch of other people's wealth and add the expertise of somebody managing it or an organization managing it, and this is their full-time job, there's a lot of meat on the bone there. Um, so, man, I got on a rant there. I forget the question. <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, that was great. Very informative. Um, it kind of answered my my suspicion i had a feeling that's what and listen say. that doesn't mean that it's um, terrible it's, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing to do but again you have to align the strategy right. with the purpose if this is the money that you're going to be relying on to recreate your income or become financially independent down the line if you're not a professional at this just playing around in your own trading account to try to create those returns or try to make a quick buck to be able to put a down payment on a house in a couple of years like that's not it's not the right tool for the job got it and actually, okay. I have a, you had mentioned, you know, the emotions of everything too, um, Eric. So what would you say is the most important thing that investors need to try to avoid in a situation where like, you know, is it, um, you know, emotion driven or, you know, what about IPOs and things like that? Yeah. So panic selling and honeymoon buying are the two, are the two main things to avoid, right? We want to buy low and sell high emotions drive us to do the opposite um when it comes to things like ipos there are a lot of people and companies that leverage ipos well ipos are a minefield there are there's massive wealth that can be gained in ipos um, there's also massive massive loss that can be experienced in ipos you have to know how to approach them appropriately and you have to have the expertise to coordinate it with the rest of your overall financial picture if you aren't a financial professional, playing around with IPOs to see what happens is generally not a recommended strategy. You also think about the amount of money that you would need to put into an IPO for it to make a super significant difference in your overall wealth. You have to concentrate a lot of risk in a singular investment to really make that a life-changing investment, which typically, Terry, is how people are pursuing IPOs. It's not part of a broader strategy. The thought is if I catch one at the right time or I catch one that's undervalued or I find some market inefficiency, it's almost this type of lottery mindset where I, man, I could make, man, I could make so much money if these four or five variables fall in my direction and maybe I could retire earlier. Maybe I could buy an investment property. Maybe I could, whatever the case is. Um, and that, that requires people to pull a lot of risk in a singular asset. Mm -hmm. So if the money is really for long-term financial health, long-term investments, your retirement, you know, unless you're a professional and you know how to coordinate it and do the rest of the portfolio management to compensate for the, for the risk, IPOs are not a, a super great long-term way there. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it does. It does. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I mean, they're not bad, but again, sure. scale, we only have yeah. our own accounts. When we pool money, we can transfer some risk onto somebody else and we can give ourselves a much better chance at long-term success. Right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. Pay people on a snap using Pop Money with Triangle's mobile or online banking. Need to reimburse someone for lunch or pay them back for something they bought for you? With Pop Money, there's no need to write a check or find an ATM for cash. 
All you need is a Triangle checking account and TCU online or mobile banking to try it out. Setting it up is easy. And when you're ready to pay, all you need is the recipient's email or mobile number. Don't bother with the hassle of setting up other digital payment accounts when you have pop money. Try it out today for a convenient way to pay others or request a payment securely and easily. Visit trianglecu.org to get started. So Eric, tell me about people who have debt. And I think the statistics are pretty high that just about everybody has debt, whether it's consumer loan debt, uh, mortgages, uh, what's the big one? Student, did I say student loan yet? Student loan. Yeah. You did it, no. but it is, the, it is out there for sure. It's there. It, uh, there's uh, just about everybody has debt. So should they be waiting to invest until they clear that up or how should they approach investing? Ooh, okay. How should they approach investing in light of having debt or should they be investing at all? Should they? Gotcha. Yeah. Answer that. Take that. So um, foundation here. Debt is one of the most polarized areas of personal financial governance because there are so many zealots on all sides of this. It's like, it's like Coke and Pepsi, like so many zealots on all sides of this debate. The actual correct answer to your question is that it differs based on your situation, but let me give you some teaching that will help you actually translate that into something actionable. Um, three key principles and concepts that may help you decide as the listener. There is a difference between good debt and bad debt. Debt is neither good nor bad. A hammer is not good or bad and a screwdriver is not good or bad, but if you're trying to drive in a, a screw with a hammer, then it's probably not going to work really well. So good debt tends to have longer amortization schedules, lower interest rates, and tax deductible interest, right? Like a mortgage is a good example of a debt that can be leveraged for, for good. Bad debt represents the opposite of that, which is shorter amortization schedules, high interest rates, carry, such as carried over revolving debts, right? Interest is not tax deductible. We talked earlier about compound interest being a good thing with investments. Compound interest in terms of cost to you is also a thing when it comes to debt. So something that has an amortization schedule where the interest is predetermined where you're paying it down on a schedule versus something like a credit card where you carry the balance over and you end up getting charged interest on the interest on the interest and it can snowball is a bad thing. That doesn't mean that all credit cards are bad, just from a broad level, right? There are some debts that are favorable and some debts that are unfavorable. So not all debt is created equal. Uh, the second concept is opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the loss of potential benefit or gain that could have been enjoyed if, if the alternative choice had been chosen. When it comes to debt, this is a really important question. When you decide to pay off debts instead of investing, you are saving the cost of interest on the debt. You are also proactively making the choice to lose the potential gain of those dollars had you invested them. Now, there's some other considerations here, like your cash flow pressure today, right? Even if you can make more investing the money than you pay on interest in the debt, if you don't have the income to cover the debt payments, then you need to get rid of some debt or refinance or whatever, right? So there's some other considerations. But if we just look at it in a vacuum, opportunity costs, apples to apples, um, the opportunity cost of saving the interest and losing the investment potential is a real thing. So, that trade-off may or may not be in your favor. We see this quite often with people paying extra on their mortgages. Is it worth paying a couple extra hundred a month to save interest on the cost on a cost of three of four percent interest, right? When you can be investing the money that compounds over time at an average of a six or seven percent rate. What's the quantifiable potential loss or gain there? Sure, you're gaining equity in your home, but that wealth is stored in an illiquid asset, which is your house. It's not an account where you can just go take money out of it if you need it. You could, if you get a home equity line, which you're going to pay a cost to go access the money, right? If you're storing that wealth or that asset in the illiquid house. So at the end of the day, your assets will generate your future income, not your lack of debt. Your assets are going to generate the future income, not your lack of debt. So the goal with debt is always to systematically reduce it over time, reduce the bad debt over time, and leverage the good debt to the extent that it can help you create more wealth. The final concept I'll share on this question is the idea of financial governance. This is super important when we're talking about debt. Debt often ends up being a wealth destroyer, not necessarily because all debt is bad, but because we behaviorally abuse it. 
we don't understand how it plays in the larger picture. We don't have the personal financial governance to restrain it to the point where we can look at it logically and unemotionally, we abuse it. So if you do not have the personal financial governance at home to use the tool, avoid the tool until you build the knowledge and the behavioral strength to use it wisely, right? Your finances need to mature along with you. Um, so accountability in this area helps a financial professional like a financial planner can help you learn how to use it wide, wisely and also provide the good pushback when you're not using it wisely. Um, but I think that's a key point because although debt is not good or bad, people can easily abuse good debt and still end up losing. We yeah. see that all the time. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Wow. Yeah. I think it was a uh, Mark Cuban who said that, you know, if you have a thousand dollars and do you invest that or do you pay off your thousand dollar debt? And he, from what I understood, he recommends paying off the debt because it's it's an instant and guaranteed return on your pretty much investment. You're paying off that debt. You no longer have that payment and you're no longer paying interest. So seems pretty accurate. Well, you know, I mean, not all the time, right? Like it, there's, there is a value to the instant gratification because here's what the instant gratification does. Because instant gratification is not logical. It's just, it's emotional, right? So you feel like you won. Right. Um, whether or not you won or lost doesn't necessarily affect the, affect the fact that you feel like you won because you see progress in the here and now. Instant gratification is valuable to the extent that it encourages the good behavior. Mathematically, you might lose by paying off the debt instead of investing the money over the long term. But maybe that instant gratification is what you need to build the financial maturity to be able to go pursue Right. So it really depends on where that person is at in the broader situation. Right. I mean, I have I have uh, I have a client that has about two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in student loan debt. Do you say two hundred and thirty thousand? Wow. And their disposition is I'm they're like, I'm never paying that debt off. The particular specs of these loans are very they're very good loans. Right. As far as loans go. And they are leveraging not paying that off and taking the money because they have the money to pay it off at this point they've had the money to pay it off for probably a decade but they're leveraging that money in so many other ways that is making them so much money there's like there's no way i would pick up two hundred thirty thousand dollars out of my accounts over here or my investment properties over here or my 401k or my individual accounts or even out of my cash flow or my bonuses and dump it on here to get rid of a two to three percent interest cost when I can leverage this into more wealth that will compound on itself. And listen, if they want to get rid of the debt at any point in time, they can just do it. Just because you invest the money instead of paying off the debt doesn't mean you're holding the debt forever. Eventually you get to the point where if you win enough, right, you have so much more money than you otherwise would have had. You can just, it's not that you don't have the money to pay off the debt. You just pay it off if it's advantageous, you keep it if it's advantageous. And that removes the emotion from the situation. Right. It gives you control over the outcome so you know what he said is well is well noted but it's not necessarily accurate for everybody and uh, just as a follow-up to the you know if you're looking at numbers to numbers eric would you say like if i had a high um let's say my credit card balance is a thousand dollars i'll just go back on what will was saying and i, I have it's like 19 yeah. you know percent interest rate right and I know that the market, if I put that thousand dollars in there on average, I'm going to get 7%, seven to 10%. So in that scenario, if it was just numbers to numbers, it would probably behoove me to just pay off that 19% because that's costing me a lot of money. If it's numbers to numbers and you don't take anything else into account in that scenario you painted, yes, it would make sense to pay off the, 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 the credit card debt. Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, that makes total sense. What you, the way you broke that down, that was very helpful. Um, basically, leveraging your money for the best option. So if you can make more money over here, then do that. But if you can pay off debt and get an emotional reward from it, then you can it's do that It's all about well. the velocity of money, right? Yeah. Think about how banks make money. I mean, right? We, we work in a credit union. Think about how banks make money, right? They, they lend the money out to you, and they're getting an interest on it. 
and everybody's paying them back, right? So they're getting cash flow every month that's coming back in. And they're taking that cash flow and they're renting it, letting it out to the next person on their mortgage, right? And it's just the money's going like round and round and round. And they're getting interest every time it's coming in and going out. Right. Right. Debt is a way that you can create that same phenomenon in your own personal financial situation if you do it right. Yeah. So this is where having some sort of third party or outside help right. is helpful because you might have the knowledge, but I'm emotional about my money because it's mine. Right. If I have a Terry or a Will that is a financial advisor that, that has the luxury of not being emotional about my money, that you can be purely logical because it's not your money. Your life doesn't change one way or another, whether I go broke. But your role is to provide that logical, unemotional, facts-based guidance and education recommendations and coaching that can really help even somebody that knows what they're doing technically and academically to make the most efficient choices. So having that macro manager is an important piece in our minds to long-term financial success. That's awesome. Got it. All right. Well, I have two follow-up questions before I get there though. Terry, do you have anything else? No, I'm good. I, I'm I'm good. I'm mesmerized by his flailing arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The whole tornado thing that he did. I tell you what, man, this guy has got a lot of energy. (laughs) I love it. I do too. Eric, you've been outstanding. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. This was a whole lot of fun. I I hope to do it again with you guys. And I hope that this has been helpful for, for our listeners. Money is really not a mystery, right? My job is not rocket science. A lot of it is taking a lot of the attitudes and emotions and sales hype and just and the accumulation of inputs we've had over time and just stripping those all away and just looking at it for what it is and then teaching it and sharing it with others so that they can implement it, reap the rewards and continue sharing it with other people. Fantastic. Eric, my two follow-up questions. One, where can people get in touch with you if they want to learn more? Yes, they can email me at ericcooper2 at financialguide.com or they can go right to the Triangle Financial Group website, which is trianglefinancialgroup.com, and fill out the contact card Perfect. Um, and ask for Eric. Those two ways are the best ways to get in touch with me. And I would love to talk to anybody um, that just has a follow-up question or, or thinks they could benefit from a conversation. Awesome, awesome. And then my last question is, everybody has, not everybody, but when you walk into a sports bar or a restaurant that has a lot of sports memorabilia and they have a, a quarterback from the Patriots on the wall. It's generally Tom Brady, but I notice that you, my friend, have Drew Bledsoe. Is that accurate? Drew? Is that Drew Bledsoe? It is. You can tell by the '90s face mask, right? I the can. Jeff George, Scott Zolak, <laughs> Scott Mitchell, right? They don't wear those face. Zach Mettenberger in like 2015 was the last quarterback to wear that face mask. Wow. Yes, I have Drew Bledsoe on the wall. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of meeting and chatting with him a couple times. Um, he actually owns a vineyard out in Walla Walla, mm-hmm. Washington, where yeah. he comes from. Um, I've had his wine. It's great. Um, if you haven't had it, you definitely want to try it. But I call Drew Bledsoe the founding father. He put us on the map. The Patriots were on their way to St. Louis before Kraft showed up. Yep. And yeah. the games were blacked out. Nobody was going to the games. Drew Bledsoe put the Patriots on the map. He made it an attractive place for Bill, for Bill Parcells to come to the Patriots right? Um, for Pete Carroll and Bill Belichick to come. So anyway, Drew Bledsoe built the foundation of the castle that Brady built. And I don't take anything away from the greatest of all time. Love Tom Brady. I have my Tom Brady mask here every single time I wear a mask in public. It's always a TB12 Tampa Bay Buccaneers mask. Very Love the cool. guy. But uh, Got to give Drew his due now. You know, you can't forget the founding father. I agree. I agree. I cannot take you can't take anything away from him. So that's great. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps up today's episode. We hope that you get a, that you got enough information out of it to make you just a little bit more comfortable with investing. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover in a future episode, please let us know. Email us, DM us on social media, call us, whatever you want. All our contact information will be in the show notes. Until next time on the Making Money Personal Podcast. Take care. Eric Cooper is a registered representative of and offers securities and investment advisory services through MML Investor Services, LLC, member SIPC, supervisory address 101 Federal Street, Suite 800, Boston, Massachusetts, 02110, 617-439-4389.